falls of my high school career. They, they go anywhere from the stresses I had from the first semester all the way to the ex amount of excitement and the amount of success that I've seen in the second semester. And being able to kind of just deal with those two things are kind of what constitute my eyes temperature. And essentially, when I looked at my topic, I first looked at, for example, the astronaut that went on the moon, Neil Armstrong, 1969, all the way to how we connect in everyday life, to the fact that you can text one another, a guy and a girl, or various other people can have some sort of nodes of communication, or other apps where people can communicate without even meeting each other in real person. The 21st century has been so advanced, and it's crazy to see the amount of data that's been collected as a result. And for those reasons, that's why I decided to pick my topic, data science. And if you look at the amount of data that we had in 2000, it constitutes one Jenga block. But if you look at the amount of data that we have today in 2019, it's multitudes amount of higher than that of what we had in 2000. And for that reason, it's important to see what we can do with the data and also the privacy is an important factor. So for those reasons, data science is becoming a particular career in the everyday world where it's growing and it's extremely applicable to every domain. And data science, just to explain in simple terms, is a combination of math, statistics, and computer science. All three of these skills put together are what constitute a data scientist. So my ISM journey in regards to data science was about trusting the process. And that's what Joel and Beach said, and that's really what I stuck up to during my ISM career. And it began with the career and industry forecasts, where I was able to have an opportunity to explore my career and understand what even a data science is. scientist is, anywhere from its certifications required to the undergraduate courses, all the way up to the average income that a typical data scientist makes. We get to the weekly progress blogs that were assigned every week, having an opportunity each and every day to be able to evaluate the amount of progress that I've made in the independent study mentorship program. And to ensure that I'm allocating my time every day towards this career that I would hopefully like to pursue in my future. Additionally, we did research assessments. Research assessments are an opportunity for me as, a, as an ISM student to look at various aspects of data science across several different angles, anywhere from that of a lawyer all the way to a technician, just looking at how data science is viewed across different dimensions, and just learning particular phenomena and theories that are related to data science. We also did several phone calls and interviews, because in the first semester of data, uh, first semester of ISM, when I studied data science, we had to do all this research. It was all about conducting informational research. And part of that was making a bunch of phone calls and conducting interviews in order to gain more information of what a data scientist is that I couldn't find on Google or I couldn't find when I did my research. Additionally, we had the mentor acquisition, which was done after I conducted all of my interviews, in which I would pick an individual who I felt was the most suitable and felt that I connected the well the most with in regards to this data science which is Mr. John Miller right here, which I'll get introduced to him soon. In addition, we also created display boards, as you can see on your left, where I was able to just put together a product where it showcases the amount of research that I've done, along with the digital and binary portfolio in which I was able to create my own website, which constitutes all of the assessments that I've completed, along with a binder paper version in which you can see all the annotations I've done. So, for example, for my career industry forecast, this was in the, the third or fourth week of August, right when we got into Mr. Prill's classroom. We did a lot of research on what our career even was. And some people had to do this two or three times, because, for example, let's just say they wanted to be a dermatologist, and they did the career industry forecast and find out, found out that dermatology is not suitable for them, they would have to do it for another topic. So this gave them an opportunity, or gave me an opportunity, perhaps, to confirmed that data science was indeed a topic that I would want to indulge myself into for the rest of this school year. So as you can see on my, on my right to your left, you can see that I've done lots of annotations and really just engaging with the text and really trying to understand what a data scientist is and trying to exert that passion on a piece of paper as I read each and every article. Additionally, the weekly, weekly progress blogs like I mentioned, these allowed me to consistently engage with ISM related material on a daily basis. Not the fact that it's just another thing that I do, but something that's really gonna hang on with me for the rest of my life. Something that I really, really am passionate about and cannot wait to do right when I get out of high school. And this allowed me to look at the pros and cons of my week, not only related to ISM, but also not related to ISM. Such as maybe the way in which I've 
the, maybe the attitude or the tone that I've set in regards to maybe my academia or other extracurriculars or other involvements. And it's just giving me an opportunity to kind of reflect on how my week went and looking at the positives and negatives associated with that. So my ventures with Mr. Matthew Pirtle, who is our ISM teacher for Heritage and Memorial High School, he taught me a lot. And it's very important, as you saw if you attended the presentation beforehand, how significant of an individual he was in shaping each and every one of us as ISM students. First off, he allowed us to craft resumes. Crafting resumes gave us as an opportunity during our interviews, like I mentioned before, to ask a data scientist, is this a well-written data science resume? Like you can ask Mr. Miller, I've asked him two to three times to review my resume to see if it fits that of a data scientist to really just ensure that I'm following the right path and I have high success at a young age. In addition, we also formulated voicemails. Voicemails gave us an opportunity to be able to communicate ideas in a cohesive manner, say if the individual did not pick up. So that's another thing that he taught us. On top of that, practicing phone calls was essential. We did lots of practice during class, two weeks before actually making phone calls. We would call each other as a joke, but we would actually be able to practice our skills. And we, of course, prepared for interviews. We had to make sure we had the right posture, we had the right eye contact, and we looked professional. Business professionalism was definitely something I got out of him. Along with engaging warm-ups that were not necessarily related to ISM, such as, uh, such as philosophical matters in regards to just TED Talks and reflecting on the way in which people perceive certain ideas and how the society has been developed in the 21st century, that's just something that Mr. Pearl has definitely brought about to my attention, has really made me a lot more aware of my surroundings as well as just how to best take advantage of the program as a student. So just to talk a little bit about my interview highlights. So I got into the fact that interviews were so essential for the first semester to answer the questions that weren't necessarily answered during my research. So I conducted a total of 15 interviews during the ISM program. And the most, uh, the most I guess, significant interviews that I had are the fact that I went to Fuddruckers actually for my interviews with uh, a guy named Mr. Anthony Klinker. It was actually a funny interview because he actually didn't show up. So it kind of shows that even in the grown up age that people may not necessarily stick to their schedule. But however, we were able to rearrange uh, another option. And from there, we were able to then schedule another interview for us to then relay more ideas to one another. In addition, two opportunities were given to me by, by 15 interviews that I had. One is by Mr. Farhad Shakran, who is a current PhD student at the University of Texas at Dallas, who I, who I interviewed through connecting and he said that if I would like to do summer research with him in regards to machine learning, which I'll get to, which is, very, uh, which is very similar to data science, he'd be willing to take me in. In addition, Mr. Ryan Elmore is a current partner for Infosys that I interviewed since he works with the AI department. Again, interviewing people that look at, different, that look at data science across different dimensions. And he gave me an opportunity to be able to potentially co-publish a research paper, which was an incredible opportunity for me. So basically the takeaways that I got from conducting 15 interviews is the fact that we're able to get a lot out of what we don't think we can get out of it. For example, if you think that you're just gonna interview someone and gain information, there, it can be taken to another level. You never know what can happen when you put yourself out there because significant things can happen that you may not imagine could possibly happen. And obviously, obviously I did the 14 interviews and I got lots of information and one of the most essential components of a data scientist is this website called Kaggle.com. Think of Reddit, but for data scientists. It was a platform for data scientists to be able to communicate uh, various ideas, share various projects, and even compete. And that's where I was looking across the ran uh, rankings. Obviously it's a Thanksgiving, I have nothing better to do than to just go on the rankings and just look at the top data scientists in the world. And I saw that they were all like Asian characters, it was kind of funny, and I saw John. And I was like, oh, that was like number, I think it was like 70 or 80. And I saw John and I clicked on it and it saw, said that he was from Dallas, Texas. And that got me extremely, extremely excited because I was like, oh, what if I even had an opportunity to talk with this guy? Because he's such a remarkable data scientist. So for those reasons, I decided that it was a really good idea to contact him via LinkedIn. And I did contact Mr. Miller through LinkedIn. And when I was able to, he, we were able to set up a Skype interview in which I was able to relay some of my questions that I had because I had 
lots of challenging questions to ask him since I had already gone through 14 other interviews where I had already gotten most of my questions answered. But there were some very specific questions that Mr. Miller was uh, would have to have answered. And then we followed up with another interview <coughs> at Cafe Brazil in which I was able to ask him if he was willing to serve as a mentor. And here we are now where we were able to have a, a mentor-mentee opportunity for me to be able to do an original work, which was the second semester. And Mr. Miller's top qualities that I would like to mention that I've gotten out of Mr. Miller, since I'm obviously a mentee and I have to learn from my mentor, is the fact that he's a very hardworking individual. If there's something that he wants to do, that's whether that's related to data scientists, data science, or any other life-related matter, he puts his hard work into it. In addition, he's an incredible, he's a credible source, as obviously he's highly ranked and is a very top-renowned data scientist in the area. Additionally, he's very patient and organized and very dedicated to what he does. And that's really what I love about Mr. Miller. And I really look up to Mr. Miller for those reasons, just because I would like to exemplify those traits in the future. So going, on, going into the second semester, I just talked about the first semester, which consisted of the research that I had to do in order to effectively understand what data science is. Now, jumping into the second semester is the original work. The original work is an opportunity for me to utilize all the skills that I've learned through all my research and all my interviews and all my assessments to then take that and apply it into an actual project that's never been created before, which I think is a very essential part and cool part about ISM. So what we decided to do was actually look at traffic, which is actually pictured here. It's a picture of Preston and Lebanon in that intersection. And that intersection basically is where the most volume of traffic pass by per day. The cool part about data science is that it can be applied to any domain you want. And we thought that by, you know, for me at least, I wanted to make an impact on my community while significantly utilizing data science related skills. And I thought that traffic would blend both of those skills together. So for those reasons, I decided to pick traffic and I looked at Preston and Lebanon and that intersection since that's where the most cars pass by per day. So that's where I can make the most impact there for. So that's what I talked about right here. There's just a lot of cars passing by in addition, there are major roads or major arteries. There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's a college prep center, there's a, there's a Walgreens, there's a lot of residential homes that exist there. In addition, there's a lot of tax revenue that's gained from here. So there's just a lot of factors that played into us choosing uh, this particular location for our original work. And the data science process that I like to explain, which I was explaining to most of you guys when you came up to my board during the first part of this final presentation, it's essentially a scientific process. So it's nothing more difficult than that. All you're doing is you first identify a use case. You identify some sort of problem that you have that you're trying to solve. And for me, that was traffic. How can we improve the traffic of Preston and Lebanon? And in order to ensure that we can then improve the delays that exist within those signal timings. And that's essentially what we were trying to answer. So to go through that, we have to have domain knowledge. Data scientists have to work across various domains if they are independent in the sense where they work across different sectors of the fields. For example, they can work with lawyers, they can work with the, the healthcare, they can even work with traffic. So you have to understand what your domain is. You, so for example, Mr. Miller and I learned about various terminologies and jargon that traffic engineers use because we actually met up with the city of Frisco. We met with two individuals, Mr. Curtis Jarecki, who is the senior traffic engineer for the city of Frisco. And we also met with Mr. Brian Moen, who is the director of transportation. So by meeting with those two individuals, they were able to throw a lot of jargon at us in which we were able to process and just learn throughout that process that you know, there's a lot more that goes on than just a red, green, and yellow light. There's a lot that goes behind that. So we had to gain that domain knowledge. And from there, we did a lot of data collection. So we had to collect that data. So what we, what we both had to do was you know, meet one day at a coffee shop and just go through and put up a request that we would file to the city of Frisco to say, hey, here are the requirements, here are the parameters that we would like for us to have in order for us to solve this problem. And it's kind of like any other scientific experiment. You know, you need to gather your materials, you need to gather your, your Bunsen burner or maybe salt or other sort of chemicals to actually do the experiment, hence the analysis in this situation. So that gets me into data cleaning, which is the fourth step. So you get all this information. However, it's not necessarily in the best form that you'd like. For example, let's just say you're in a you know you're in a science experiment, like you're doing a science experiment, and you have a lot of let's just say you have a lot of carbon dioxide like in a in a liquid version, let's just say, and you're trying to extract a certain amount of it. There's going to be a tedious process that requires you. Like you have the material that you need, 
but it's gonna take a lot of effort for you to be able to extract that material. So similar to that, we had data that was just messed up. We had to figure out which variables that we wanted within that data package. There were like 15, 20, numerous different types of data, anywhere from how long it takes to stop uh, at a red light every 15 minutes of the 24 hour day, all the way to the amount of lanes and how that impacted the volume of cars per 15 minutes. There's just a lot of information to just sum that up. So we had to figure out which data we need. From there, we had to go data exploration. And this is what we call, I guess, the pre-analysis. So before actually conducting the experiment, you just do a couple of trials and a couple of errors just to see if you're actually doing the experiment correctly. You don't want to use too much of your, inf like, you don't want to use too much of your, I guess, your materials because you want to make sure that you're using them effectively. So data exploration is another step to that, and that's where we were able to explore a lot of what we had. And from there, we do the actual data science, which is what we are looking to expand into the following year, which is where we're gonna integrate machine learning and predictive modeling. So machine learning and predictive modeling are not a necessity to conduct a data science project, but rather strategic tools and methodologies that are used to help make your data science project and your proposal more enhancing and more to add more flavor to it. So since I'm obviously at a high school level, I'm I'm obviously looking at data in a very like in a very generic way. We used Excel, which I will get to. And obviously at the end you're delivering that insights and recommendations. Think of a weather forecast uh, an individual who's delivering the weather forecast for the following week. He gives you the predictions of what the weather ought to be. However, there's no guarantee that the weather may be that way. For example, if they say it's gonna be a 40% chance of rain at 2 p.m. on Thursday, it may not even rain at all, or it may rain in thunderstorm, which they weren't even aware of. So that's why everything is very hypothetical. There's no guarantee that you get from your insights or recommendations, but rather very convincing uh, evidence, since it's obviously you're using math and statistics and computer science. So like I mentioned before, it's just like the scientific process. And just to go deep into each, uh, each particular step in a, in a very, I guess, quick way, is that we want to understand our context. So we, what we did was to really just understand what traffic is and what are the various issues that can exist for traffic. We looked at what, something called a logic tree. Mr. Miller gifted me a book called Problem Solving 101, which is actually used in Japan to teach fifth graders or elementary school students how to actually attack a problem and attack it in a logical way. So by utilizing one of the methods, it's called logic tree. So logic tree is you take your basic idea of traffic flow and you, do a, you branch it off into several different dimensions, anywhere from what happens if I change my infrastructure? What if I add a lane? What if I remove a lane? What if I close the left lane on this side? Or what if I change the, you know, what if I just close the intersection on, the, on this intersection parallel to it? There's so much variation that exists. And that's really just the beauty of data science where you can have all these various possibilities. And this is just a generic one. It can even blow up past this. And it just shows the amount of potential that this field has. And especially, and this is just traffic, so there's so many different domains as well. So from there we understood like what traffic is. We knew all the variables. We were basically, I guess, quote unquote, traffic experts because we knew what the variables were and what they, how, how they were implied. So like I mentioned before, we wrote that proposal that we then sent off to the city of Frisco. So we first had an initial interview with them just to tell them what we were trying to do. From there, we wrote the proposal and emailed it to them, in which we were then able to follow up in another interview, which I was able to go to and just talk to them about what we need, and they kind of sorted out what, through what they had and provided what we need. And from here, this is kind of the information that it looks like. So this is what they gave us. So I don't know, I don't know if you are necessarily an expert at how this is laid out, but it's not necessarily the cleanest. And that's why we had to do data cleaning right after the collection. And just looking at specifically what this is, is for example, there is in Preston Road, Preston Lebanon, if you look eastbound and westbound, you can see that every 15 minute interval, they are telling you how many cars pass by eastbound and westbound. They even give you a total as to how many pass by westbound and how many pass by eastbound. And they tell this for every 15 minute interval, and it's an average. So that's what we got. And the data cleaning is basically taking, in a very simplified term, you're taking the human, uh, the, compa the compatible data and turning it into something that a machine can understand. And that's really what I was trying to get out of it. And 
that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to take data that we humans can see, like as you can see right here, we can read this, but computers and machines cannot. So what we're doing is we're taking that data that we can read and transforming it into something that a machine can now understand. While we can simultaneously understand as well, because machine learning, again, is us humans teaching machines how to learn the material. So we are the teachers, we are the instructors. And this is an example of data cleaning. So like I mentioned before, you saw what we had before. We had all the blue cells, everything was kind of jumbled all over the place. Now we organized it in a way that we wanted it to uh, be presented. So now we can see like all the times are neatly listed. You can see a total count. It's very easy visuals for the reader to just understand. And it's very easy for the machine to understand as well. So for those reasons, we can clearly see that there is a correlation between just the sum of it northbound and southbound as well as the grand total. And it's very easy and simplified for the machine to then process that data. So then following part is the data exploration phase. So we took what we just formed. We cleaned up all this information. Now how can we explore it? Well, what we can do is we can transform it into what we call a pivot table. There are so many various ways to do this, but what we did as, is that as a high school student, obviously uh, extremely, uh, extremely knowledgeable in Excel, I decided to use Microsoft Excel. And we have these things called pivot tables where you're able to manipulate various variables within it to really just get a picture and tell a story. Which is why we had a story in the first place. When you saw my board, you see that data science is essentially all about storytelling and how you present the information in a consistent manner. So what I was able to do is just take that and look at it in various angles and just really just try to understand what this information is like. So from there, part two is taking all of the sources together and then now we're combining it to create models and simulations. So that's just the potential of data science. The fact that you're able to take all the information that you've got, you've cleaned up all this information, and now what you can do is take that machine-ready data and transform it into simulations. Mr. Miller and I have proposed ideas, if we uh, work long-term, to potentially create a simulation which we have in the intersection labeled, and we have cars flowing that model the information that we had and the variables and the information and the numbers that we collected. So that's what we call machine learning, like I mentioned before, and applied statistics. Because you're taking the introductory statistics and you're, you're advancing at a higher level. You're looking at z-scores and even more, um, more advanced phenomena in addition to that. And you're using open source data because, like I said, a data scientist is nothing more than a scientist who goes through the scientific process and uses data. So a scientist must scavenge. It must go through all the information that he, and her, he or her has to really just make sure that he or she's able to give the best output possible. So with that, all of that being said, and I know it's maybe particularly overwhelming since obviously there's a lot of material that may be unfamiliar, I would like to discuss the takeaways that I had from the program. Because as much as I was able to become a better data scientist, so to speak, I definitely got a lot out of the program as an individual that I can hopefully transform into my final year of high school along with college. So first off, I definitely feel like I've gained a lot more confidence. If you asked me to speak on this, on this podium right here on the first day of school, there would be no way that I would have the same confidence and I would be stuttering, I would be seeing a lot of ums, but Mr. Pirtle's uh, grit and perseverance to make each and every individual a better speaker and a better communicator, I was able to grow my ability to communicate my ideas in a cohesive manner. And communication, in fact, is one of the most essential components of a data scientist. Because right now, I'm communicating to an audience that more than likely is not familiar with data science, or maybe it's more than familiar not specifically um, understanding of what traffic is, even though John, Mr. John Miller would understand. So I have to obviously take my words and put it in a simplified way to make sure that our audience right here is able to understand what I'm saying. And that's really where I got the communication from. And the worth ethic, the passion, and the drive has definitely come from me. Because at the beginning of this year, I was like, okay, I'm taking independent study mentorship because I want to figure out a career that, that would suit me the most. But with Mr. Pirtle's, obviously, his TED Talks and his lessons and his life lessons and his lectures, I've just learned so much that, you know, on a philosophical standpoint, there's a lot that goes into an individual to really reach his goal. And that, you know, the goal is not just about short term, but you want to also look long term. And that life is not just about your academics. It's not just about getting a 100 in a class. It's not taking, about taking seven or eight APs. 
but rather it's about really advancing yourself as an individual. How can you stand out from the pack? How can you be someone that can make an impact on your particular community or your family or your friends and your peers? What can you do to make your current society a better one? And that's really what I learned from Mr. Pearl. That's really what I learned from ISM. And I guess my most notable accomplishments in addition to the ISM program is that I'm humbly uh, excited to announce that I'm actually currently the valedictorian of my class, which definitely comes from Mr. Pearl because of the fact that he has taught me how to work hard. In addition, just the, you know, the amount of support that I've gotten from my parents as well as Mr. Miller, just this idea of how, you know, if you believe in something and you really want it and you put your all into it, you will get the result. In addition, I was able to compete in BPA and DECO, both of which I was able to place at the national and state level. And those are just things, again, that come from that work, work ethic, that passion, that drive, and that resilience to, to reach your goal no matter what, and to not let any obstacles come in the way, despite the fact that I had developmental speech and language disorder as a small kid, the fact that I struggled speaking, and I had to go to a speech therapist, and I had to go and fight through that in elementary school to get where I am now. There's a lot that goes through that process. And there's a lot of resilience that's required and just not giving up on your goal I think is just such an invaluable skill that each and every one of us can definitely have. And the Frisco Ignite event, as you guys may or may not know of, is an event that my friend Harsha and I, who was unfortunately unable to make it today, uh, are, are something that we created over the 12 to 14 month time span. And we had over a thousand attendees at that event, so it was a remarkable success. Again, believing in that goal and ensuring that we just put our all into it, we're able to get it. And just really thinking in a, in a wisdom approach. Just, you know, listening to podcasts recently is something that I've been doing. I haven't really listened to podcasts. I used to listen to, you know, just your typical Spotify music. But now I'm starting to listen to podcasts from renowned individuals who talk about, you know, how they pave their life and how they're able to, you know, improve their memory tricks or improve the way in which they interact with individuals or how to remember a name. All of these things have just been accomplishments that I've been uh, humbly able to uh, definitely own up to. And I just hope that you know, with ISM and with all the things I'm doing, I'm able to continue to add on to that list. And I just want to give a huge special thanks to, first off, to my family. Uh, I cannot thank you, Amanapa, and Rasya Rishik and Raya. My, you know, uh, being a family of six, it's very difficult for me to have the ability for them to be able to drop me off and pick me up at places. And it's very difficult because obviously I didn't have a license, so it was hard for me to get from point A to point B. And the fact that they were so supportive of what I was able to do, this fact, despite the fact that I had so much struggle growing up and being able to speak here today, there's just a lot that they have done for me. And they always tell me that it's not about doing well academically, it's about putting your character before everything else. And, I'm, and each and every day I try to improve my character because I know that's what's gonna get me places like Mr. Pirtle mentioned and what Mr. Miller has taught me. The fact that if you have good character, people are gonna wanna come to you and people are gonna want to be with you. And that really gets, um, uh, really adds on to Mr. Pearl and Mr. Miller, both of whom have mentored me in such an invaluable way. Like, I cannot thank you enough, Mr. Miller, for teaching me uh, so much. And, you know, it's just been like a pleasure working with you. And one of the things I like to present as part of the program is just this plaque right here. So if you could stand, I'll give him a round of applause for being my mentor. So all these individuals, as you can see, and of course, uh, the friends that have come here, and I cannot thank you all enough for all the support that you guys have had. And this is Harsha, by the way. Everyone give Harsha a round of applause. Uh, we, we did Frisco Ignite together, and I cannot, just, I cannot just stress enough how much my friends have made a profound impact on me. Uh, just, you know, the fact that, you know, as a kid growing up, I didn't have many friends. Like I said, I had developmental speech and language disorder, and a lot of people wouldn't come to me. I'd always get bullied and made fun of, and just to see the fact that growth is a reality and the fact that we can improve and we do have a growth mindset that's where it really is going to take you places guys and i did not know that and i really learned that through ISM. i just i just thought about how i was able to pave my path from kindergarten and now and i can clearly see you know with mr pearl's lessons with the podcasts that i've listened to and all of the various things i've done that it wasn't just a simple snap that allowed me to get to who i am today but rather the fact that i was able to push through and fight for what i wanted and that allows me to end with this quote, and it's very important to understand that failure, guys, is the key to success. 
and that each mistake teaches us something. If I were to count, if I were to have a nickel for every time I made a mistake, I'd be the richest man on earth. I've made so many mistakes and I cannot emphasize that enough. You know, anywhere from, you know, maybe not behaving well at school, always getting in trouble every day, not having to stand the wall for recess all the time. I was like a very naughty kid growing up. To now the fact that, you know, maybe there might be decisions that I may not necessarily make that are necessarily the most wise. So there are mistakes that I make and it's important that we learn something, we take away something from that mistake. You don't just move on, but you say, okay, why did I make that mistake? And move on and find a way to uh, improve yourself and improve the people around you. That's really what I got from Morihi Oshiba, who was a famous writer, and that's really what I got out of the Independent Study Mentorship Program. Just the fact that, you know, if you put your heart into something and you really want it from the bottom of your heart and you want to fight for it, it doesn't matter if you have a disorder when you're five years old. It doesn't matter if you're not interested in your topic in the beginning of ISM, or it doesn't matter if you have family issues or other sort of um, that circumstantial uh, situations that you can't control. You will fight for your goal and you will do it. And that's what I'd like to end with. I'd like to thank you all for coming to my ISM final presentation and making my dream a reality. Thank you.